welcome to Doja Live this Wednesday, May 31st, 2023. We're just talking backstage. I cannot believe it's the end of May already. This year has certainly flown by already. Um, my name is Kim Lantis. I'll be hosting today along with America Guerrero. Hello. Hey, America. Hello. And of course, the best person, the most important person on today's show, our guest, who is Roy Gonzarski. Roy is the CEO of Alithian. Roy, thank you so much for joining us today. No, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's going to be a really, really fun conversation as we unpack the digital world, Web3, what that means that we still live in a physical world. Um, but before we dive into all of that, we'd really like to get to know you better. Roy, what's your story? What's led up to Alithian? Uh, well, I am originally from Israel. I came to the United States uh, almost 26 years ago this summer. It's amazing how fast that's gone by uh, to go to graduate school at the University of Washington with an ultimatum from my wife that will stay just for the two years and go back home. And we <laughs> just fell in love with the place and stayed. I uh, worked at Boeing for quite some time, then at a few other software and hardware startups, uh, and eventually made it to Alithion to try and change the world of, uh, of uh, counterfeits and track and trace. Three kids, uh, two already in, in university, and one about to start. So about to be an empty nester. All right. An empty, that's, this is a whole other new level, new phase of life. That's going to be really exciting. <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> Perfect. So let's talk a little bit about Alithian. You talked about wanting to battle counterfeit. What exactly is it that you do? So uh, Alithion fingerprints products. Basically, if you think of how people... Uh, protect or identify themselves. If you really want high security, you fingerprint them, right? You don't rely on a badge or an ID or anything like that that could be faked or lost. You use fingerprints. They're inherently part of your body. You can't really copy them or give them away unless you believe, you know, Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible. But other than that, it's pretty secure. And if I have your fingerprint, I don't need anything else. And we found that we could do the same thing for physical items. We can fingerprint them uh, without touching them just by taking a picture because there are things that we can talk about on uh, what is on those items, but we can fingerprint them. And then anyone in the world at any time, any place can take a picture of them again. We'll create another fingerprint and compare them. And just like if you ever watched CSI or any of those detective movies where they look for fingerprints and find the person, we do the same thing. We find that specific product, not a product. For example, it's not a black cat or a can of Coke. We find the can of Coke and the black cat. So from that perspective, really identifying the unique item. That's what we do. That is actually very mind-blowing. I've got so many questions coming up already. I can say personally, the first things that are coming to my mind are, um, I, this is my guilty pleasure, but I've recently got into watching like TikTok videos of people who buy from thrift stores and things and then resell them. Yep. And the first thing that's coming to my mind, I know nothing about um, you know, name brands or, you know, handbags or things, but like, is this an authentic coach, right? We can sell it as an authentic coach. And not only is it authentic, but which one it is, that's, right. that's crazy. So let's not, I just kind of derailed us there, but let's get into it. <laughs> America, what is the question that we're actually really looking to answer today? Yes. The question is, how can optical AI tech improve security and trust while linking the digital and physical worlds without harming physical asset integrity? Please share with us the answer. So actually, interestingly enough, uh, it is very close, if not including what you mentioned. Uh, you talked about luxury goods, right? The coach handbag, the Rolex watch is what people usually talk about. In fact, Louis Vuitton handbags is usually what talks about because they get faked a lot. Uh, and that is something we do. Uh, but the problem is much bigger when you talk about fakes and gray market. Fakes, of course, being things that look like the real item for the one reason of taking money away from you illegally. Gray market is even harder. Gray market are real items being sold illegally. So, for example, medicine, medicine that's expired, bad people will get their hands on it, erase the old date, print on a new date, and sell it as new. Brake pads that maybe fail quality control or battery cells for an electric car that fail battery control, bad people will get their hands on it, change the uh, listing, put on quality control stickers on it, and sell them as they're okay. And so fake and gray market are way beyond just luxury goods. I mean, that's important, right? There's financial impact, consumers get hurt, the companies get hurt. But we're talking really about next level fakes and gray market. 
brake pads for a car, medicine, medical implants, uh, things that have to do with people's health and safety, parts that go into planes that are fake. So that's what we're trying to solve by taking a picture because the current methods simply don't work. If you, if I can interrupt here, what if we take it, take it a step back? Like, I get the reason why the technology in the gray market and the dangers and implications of that implies, but why do we have to come so far to have this technology? What's the problem that underlies this? Why are these pharmaceutical companies or these brake pad manufacturers or whoever not properly disposing of the faulty goods in the first place? Well, you know, we, we've come to find that greed is an amazing, amazing incentive. And if there's money to be made, rightfully or wrongfully, someone will find a way to do it. And it's unfortunate. And people think about, oh, fake medicine, fake brake pads. That can't be in the US or in Europe. That must be in Africa or Asia. No, US and Europe, every year, millions and tens of millions of dollars worth of fake plane parts, car parts, medical equipment is found. And because money can be made. And so the challenge is the way companies today try and fight that is with, is with all sorts of what we call additives, barcode stickers, hologram stickers, NFC tags, RFID tags, invisible dust that's put on the product, all sorts of things that are man or person made. Now, of course, just like the virus antivirus uh, issue of someone creates an antivirus, someone creates a virus that beats it, and it keeps going back and forth. Same thing is done here. We have anti-counterfeit hologram stickers. And guess what? The Chinese have figured out two days later how to create the anti-counterfeit uh, stickers and put them on fake products. And so as long as you're relying on some additive, it doesn't work. That's why we have to develop this technology that's similar to fingerprints, where we don't rely on anything being added or manipulated on the items. What about things being taken away? I mean, I'm really curious, what, what creates a, an, a fingerprint on a physical asset, especially when we're looking at things that are, in theory, duplicates? They're all the same, right? Those brake pads, I think, yep. are all using the same mold yep. and whatever else. Same production line, yeah, things coming off one after the other, same production line. That's the beauty. My history in manufacturing, having you know done it in aerospace, and most people involved in manufacturing know that machines can't make the same thing over and over again really, really accurately, meaning they do it within a tolerance. So if I wanted, let's say, you know, this earphone box made, the design engineer will tell the manufacturer, hey, I need to be, let's say, two inches wide, plus minus a thousandth of an inch. I need this aircraft part to be a millimeter thick, plus minus a micron. Why? Because the machine can't do it exactly the same. But as long as you're within that range, within that band, your quality is good. It'll perform what it's supposed to do. It'll look the way you want it to do. And no one will be able to tell the difference. It's not a bad thing. It's just the fact of life. And so engineers work really hard to figure out these tolerances. Quality control systems will say, as long as you're within that band, you're good to go. You've passed. What our genius mathematicians have found, and I don't use the term genius lightly, they are geniuses. What they found is, we can actually identify on every single item those random, call them flaws or features or aspects of manufacturing that aren't the same from product to product. But what's really so it's cool like is like one stitch. There, this, you know, this it's not one... a stitch. The stitch is obvious, right? The stitch is the obvious stuff. That's what the counterfeiters go after. We look at the material, we look at the metal, at the plastic, at the paper, we look at the things that the human eye can't see and thus can't fake. And because they are random by nature, we can create a fingerprint out of them. Now, the nice thing is, you might say, well, what if someone just knew what the fingerprint looks like and faked it? The original machine can't do it. That's why they continuously change. So the original machine can't make the same product over and over again. So a counterfeiter definitely can't. And since they don't know what they're looking for, they can't counterfeit or cheat. Now, moreover, because we can identify every single item, you can't do gray market either. You can't say, oh, I'm changing the date on the box. And so now the expiration has, has gone forward. No, because we'll identify it and say, hey, I know what that product is, that specific item. And I know that it expired two months ago. You can write anything you want on it, but I can tell you the truth. Hmm. Hmm. Go ahead. <laughs> I have a question. Um, I will share a personal story. My husband, he his fingers exploded because he was playing with fireworks, okay? So his fingerprints are not the same. 
kids don't play with that. So I'm thinking with items, what happens if their digital fingerprints change? How will that change? Because the materials are going to change or what is the process of that? Like Re if a box question. gets crushed, for example. Yep, yep, really, really good question. And so to a certain degree, our system doesn't impact or isn't impacted from that. In fact, we have done with some of our customers 25 year aging tests. So they simulate aging of these products, you know, bang them around, scratch them, et cetera. And we have 100% success identifying them. We can scratch products, mark them. We can bend some stuff. We have some uh, parts that we work with where we start with flat sheet metal. We register that in our system. Then it goes through these giant stamping machines that make them into parts. They bend them, they crush them and so on. And we can take a picture of the part and with 100% accuracy tell them what sheet metal it came from. So from that perspective, the system is very robust. Now, to a degree, right? If I were to take, uh, a, for a simple example, a piece of paper and register it and then burn it up, then there's no more fingerprint. To your point, America, if there's no finger, there's no fingerprint. And so we'd have to do something again. But at that point, you don't really need our help to say something's wrong with that product, right? It's either completely damaged or destroyed. So from that perspective, we're less of use and less of need. Where the real need is, is there's been some slight change and maybe a few scratches where people try to pretend it's a real but used product. We will immediately catch that without a problem. Hmm. This is interesting. I, I would like to talk a little bit about where we're at and where we're going, particularly with what we chose about this idea of Web3. Um, I, I think even Web3, to me at least, has it's hard to define. I think it's still, this I means this is Web3 to me, this is Web3 to you. And, and heck, even if we talk about artificial intelligence, there's different definitions, yep. right? But what does this look like in terms of what's the benefit here of photos um, versus something like blockchain that's, you know, tokenization? Um, what's the difference here? How does this... So, so here, here's the, the fallacy of this whole digital world. I'm not talking about the, the fun and games in a metaverse or virtual reality, et cetera. I'm talking about real world. There's a mixed blurred line that maybe is done intentionally, but it's incorrect that says, if I have a secure digital asset, then the physical asset must be secure as well. If I have a blockchain that says, it, or an NFT that says, this is a real headset and it belongs to Roy, that's great. The Digital file is indeed protected. Blockchain NFTs are amazing at protecting and securing digital assets, digital data. But what tells me that that blockchain actually is connected to this, right? To the now, real one. The real item, right? Like, With you can track the digital thing. We actually had a whole show on this about contracts. How, like, exactly. So, so they can move from place to place and everyone will track them and everyone knows you can't manipulate them. So I can see the truth about the digital contract. But what about my physical item? When I was in aerospace building uh, 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 aircraft engines, electric engines, we'd have suppliers come and say, oh, Roy, you know, we're so secure. We use Web3 to secure your parts for the motor. So oh, tell me more. I said, well, you see this airplane part or this engine part. When we create it, the certificate of manufacture is put into the blockchain. And then as we move it and ship it and bring it to you, everything's in the blockchain. So you know it hasn't been tampered with. And then I would ask, well, how do I know that blockchain belongs to this part? And the answer is, oh, there's a barcode sticker that's on the part. You just have to read it. Or there's a serial number on the part. Just read it. It's like, well, that, those can be tampered with, manipulated, scratched off. And then there's no response. And that's the fallacy, right? People believe that if you protect the digital aspect of a product, the physical real world product is protected. And that's not the case. In fact, it's the opposite. It could lead to overconfidence. Oh, if I use blockchain, this physical item must be real. In fact, that's the easiest way to cheat. I get a fake item and I tell you, here's the blockchain certificate and you're all happy. No, no, make sure there's a link, an irrefutable link to the physical product. And because we don't believe and we're seeing it today that additives, stickers, serial numbers, QR codes, NFC tags, all of those things can either be damaged, intentionally moved, or even counterfeited themselves, that's why we rely on the digital fingerprint of the item itself. That's great. How so does it work? Together with blockchain, you are like an unbeatable counterfeit shield. 
Right. For the, I, I mean, I would argue that we'd maybe yeah. need both, right? Like, yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You want both. So for example, with some customers, we'll do a feature print of the physical item and then mint that fingerprint as an NFT. Now, the NFT as a product, we don't care about that. That's not important. But what we do is, is give you the digital certificate, irrefutable, that says, I own this real physical item. Now you have real dual factor authentication, right? I know that these pair of shoes, this watch, this brake pad, this airplane part is real. And I can prove that it belongs to me or in fact has the right certificate, etc. That link is the most powerful thing you can do. That's the connection between physical and digital. But how does it look like that link? For example, if I see a pen, I have a pen. How am I going to find that link? Yeah, you won't. What you do is if that pen manufacturer tells you, hey, I have feature printed those pens, you can then take the app that we have or the manufacturer will give you. You'll take a picture of that pen and it'll tell you, one, is that pen real or not? Which pen is it? So not just it's a pen, it's pen number 173-4 wow. that you bought two weeks ago. And then it'll tell you, by the way, there's an ownership NFT that goes with it. Do you have the NFT? So imagine now in the next generation of uh, secondary hand markets, to your point, the thrift store, but let's go even higher end. Someone says, hey, I have a pair of, I don't know, make it up. I have a Rolex that Tom Cruise wore to the Emmys. Do you want to buy it? And look, I have it here. So you could take our app, take a picture of that watch, and it'll tell you, one, is it a real Rolex or not? Two, is it the actual Rolex that Tom Cruise wore? And it'll tell you, by the way, there's an ownership NFT. So you could say to the seller, do you have the NFT? And if there's a blank stare, you know that that watch is not theirs to sell. So again, it gives you that tremendous, powerful connection between physical and digital. No different than, hey, government, Here's a bunch of semiconductors you can put on your jets or your planes. Here you go. I can prove that they're real. You can, the government can take a picture or the soldier can take a picture and say, yeah, these are real ones. But by the way, they were reported, diverted two weeks ago out of the manufacturer's hand. You may want to ask questions. And so it really eliminates all those aspects of fraud and, and foul play that come into the, the world of physical assets. Nice. This leads me to another question. Do I need to have a powerful camera to take that picture? Do I need to have like a, yeah. the last iPhone or it could be like a normal cell phone? So I, I guess it depends on what you call normal. So right now, for example, we use things like the iPhone 13 or above, uh, Samsung S21s and above, etc. So phones that have good cameras, 12 megapixel cameras. We're not talking about, you know, 48 megapixel, but we do want a good camera on the phone. But it doesn't need any special equipment. There's no special readers or special printers because we're not printing anything. There's no special lighting, infrared, nothing. Just the phone itself or a standard industrial camera uh, for a lot of the manufacturers that use industrial mm -hmm. cameras. Everything's off the shelf. So that and that's and that way it can be um, what's the word scaled? Like yep, if exactly in a, in a manufacturing company, I mean. I'm assuming I get this off of television, you know, how is it made? But, <laughs> but at some points in the quality control and everything, they're taking pictures anyway, usually, right? In order to- That's right. And, and they're used to, and exactly right. They're, they're used to having cameras on the production line. And the nice thing is because we don't have to touch the item or market, we don't have to in, introduce new machinery that says, oh, here's my sticker machine. Here's my laser engraving machine. Here's my whatever it is machine. And I don't need any other machine on the other side. And I don't have to tell the product manufacturers, oh, by the way, you have to redesign your product so that there's room to put my sticker on it. Imagine some nice product. And now you say, oh, by the way, where's my QR code going to go to secure that product? Who wants that? Plus, it's not reliable. And so, again, we just put a camera, take a picture of the product as is, and we're done. Wow. And it doesn't even need to be like all four sides or anything. It can just be one side really depends on what you want to do. For example, if let's say we have, we have companies that we work with that do collectible trading cards. So they like baseball cards and so on. You know, we're talking anywhere from $1,000 for one of these cards to $12 million for one of these cards. So they'll take a picture of the front and the back just to be secure. We have companies that do gold bars. Some of them do just one side because they want to be able to identify it irrefutably. Some of them do all six sides. Watch companies, some will do just the front. 
Some will do the front, the back, the inside, the bracelet. It really depends on each one. Brake pads, you'll just do the front because that's all you need. So it really depends on the product and the use case. A customer can decide what they need. But we just need a single image. It's not some sort of 3D walk around, nothing, a simple picture. Wow. This is insane. This is like the craziest technology I had never heard of. <laughs> yeah. It's it, it crazy. It, it's, you know, it's one of those things that when you have experienced mathematicians, I like to, to tell folks, we're not a startup of 24-year-old star, uh, Stanford and Harvard dropouts. Uh, you can see I'm a little older than 24. And there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. They do amazing startups. But when just it comes a little, to right? just a little. Just a little. When it comes to something like this that requires this real-world experience and expertise, our mathematicians who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s are the ones that invented, for example, in the 1990s, the ability for the U.S. Postal Service to manage mail by taking pictures of the envelopes. So if you've ever seen movies of that mail and envelopes in the thousands are going down these conveyor belts, something's taking a picture and it routes them. Our guys invented that in the 90s. So it's not like, oh, I'm trying something new. They've been there. They've done that. Yeah. Optical AI or machine oh, vision is something they do. So many levels, not just because of, you know, the, um, oh gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the sense of authority that it gives you, right? And, but, um, but also just the fact that, like, you're never too old to make a difference. You're never too old Absolutely. to keep creating and keep applying. I think it's so easy for us to always focus on, like, youth, right? And th that's amazing. So let's talk about this technology. I mean, we, we, I think we've done a really great job of understanding what it does, why it matters, but to the best of your ability, of course, without revealing your, your secret sauce. But how does this work? Like, how long did this tech go to develop? What types of, you know, software or coding or what's going on here? So, so it took us about five years to develop this. Uh, because this is really, really deep tech. Uh, we don't use machine learning. We don't use kind of the external model, AI models, et cetera. Everything was developed in-house. We use discrete mathematics uh, algorithms because that's the only way to identify the product, not a product, right? A lot of the machine learning ones or AI will say, oh, look, uh, I know what that is. It's an earphone box. And I can even tell you, I think it's real or not. The problem with that is, or the challenge is, if you want to know, is this a real one and has it been stolen, you won't be able to know that because I don't know which one it is. I can only tell you it's a real one. I can't tell you that it's expired. It's medicine that's expired and has been rerouted. I can only tell you it's real medicine. So again, it doesn't allow you to track and trace. It doesn't allow you to identify. So we couldn't use machine learning or kind of external AI models. We had to develop that in-house. We also couldn't allow what a lot of our competing systems, the existing systems have, which are false positives. Let's take medicine for an example. If I tell you this real medicine is fake and I'm wrong, you've lost a few bucks. If I tell you this fake medicine is real and I'm wrong, that's a problem. That's a false positive that cannot be allowed. Same thing with breaks. Oh, it these fake breaks are real. Be the yeah. yeah. And so we said when we go to production, we cannot have false positives, like zero false positives. So it took us a long time to get to that point where we felt comfortable enough to where that's where we are. And today, that's how we go to market. Zero false positives in production. And so we developed it for about five years, all in-house built algorithms. We have over 45 approved patents on this. So if there are copycats out there that are saying, oh, I can also do this, beware. You might want to check all of the patents out there and how they can be applied or if there's a problem. So the team was really good at protecting the amazing job that they did in developing this. And basically what we do is, if the system, we take a picture, the system looks at that picture and in a way that I cannot and will not describe, finds those things that shouldn't be there. Now, a lot of companies will say, oh, I do pattern recognition. I can see what this is like. I can see the line and so on. So I learn what this is and I can tell you, now I know what it is. We actually disregard all of that stuff because the things that are supposed to be there are going to be the same. So I don't want to look at that. If I'm looking at a fingerprint, I'm not looking at your shirt because anyone could buy the shirt. I want to look at the, the ridges and the changes on the skin of your finger because that's what's different. That that's little patch of plastic where the dye didn't get mixed in thoroughly, <laughs> exactly. those types of things. Yeah. Exactly. And so, so we, our approach is I don't want to look for the fake. I want to tell you what's original. 
And if I know what's original, by definition, I can tell you what's fake, what's cheated, what's stolen, what's been expired, etc. When do you think that this technology is going to apply in organisms? Because I was thinking, I want a plant that is that it was cultivated in Africa and it has like these nutrients. And then I found out that this plant was cultivated in Mexico City. It is fake, right? Is it? When is that going to be possible? Or is that already possible? Is that? What I don't. Happening? Yeah. I don't know that we'll be able to do that. We, anecdotally, we had a company approach us if we could do marijuana plants as they grow. Now, as much as the team were excited to do some trials and testing uh, on that. Uh, what kind of testing, right? <laughs> we'll leave that, we'll leave that uh, to, to, to something else. But, but they wanted to do testing and trials for excitement. But we said we're, we'll stay away from that because the plant, by definition, it's organic. continues it's to changing. change all the time. Yeah. And so... To think that while we could maybe develop something as a startup, one of the important things for us is focus, right? You can do all sorts of cool science projects. Oh, let's see if we could do it. Let's follow the plant and so on. I'm too busy and we have enough to do with inorganic things like medicine, brake pads, plane parts, luxury goods, right? We have enough to do there that we don't have the time or resources to try and defocus and look at something shiny like uh, plants. Maybe one day, but not right now. Because what this is, I mean, it's really to your point, Merrick, I think I always, I always have movie references. I'm sorry, folks, I don't get out. I really need to find a better hobby. But it makes me think of the movie Minority Report with, with Tom Cruise. We already talked about him. Uh, so there's like the ability to just, you walk by and they're like personalizing billboards to hello, blah, 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 blah. So like your technology actually in however many years could potentially be applied to something similar like that, you think? Maybe, but I view it and we view it more importantly as, again, you walk in the physical world and you're about to pick up a product that you want to buy or get or give and you could just look at it with your future get goggles or whatever the future phone is or your watch, look at it and tell you, uh, hey, don't buy that product. It's not what you think it is. Or you just got this as a gift. It's used. Uh, it was bought in this market or in the thrift store, or it's been reported stolen. Or someone, I mean, imagine avoiding theft. Today, people rob collectible stores, and then they go to the pawn shop and sell it. Imagine that every pawn shop can take a picture of it and say, hey, that was stolen. Then if the thieves know that anything they try to sell can be identified, then why steal it? So this could really, that's how we look at it in the future. If there's something that can never be counterfeited or irrefuted or refuted, meaning I can tell you if it's real, not real, fake, transparent, uh, uh, expired, etc., then suddenly trying to cheat the system goes away. So it really becomes a system to stop theft, fraud, etc., because you can't get away with it. I see. I mean, I, I it does sound a little idealistic to me in terms of fully stop. Like, like you said at the beginning, right? Bad guys are going to be bad guys. So I think there's probably always going to be absolutely that market, unfortunately. But this ability to really make it wide scale and a heck of a lot harder. And basically making bad guys work, I guess, only with bad guys, right? Because, yep. yeah, and which protects, I think, the, the rest of us. You know, Roy, we've come to the end of our show today. So I'd like to bring it back to you as an individual, your words of wisdom, everything you've learned throughout this journey. I mean, even taking it back to your amazing team of, you know, people where we might not expect to see such amazing technology come out of because of um, age bias or whatever else it might be. What has this journey been like? And what are some words of wisdom that you might have um, to, to share with the audience today? Uh, I would talk about two things. One is transparency. Everyone should know everything about what's going on in the company. I found that to be a, a key, key success aspect of previous companies I've been with and a key failure aspect of companies I've seen as well, which is it's a need to know basis or, hey, I'll tell you when, I, when, you're, when you need to know it, or you shouldn't get involved with this because you don't understand it. No, everyone should know everything. At Alithion, everyone knows how much money we have in the bank, what customers are happy, what customers are unhappy, who made mistakes, because it allows all of us 
to learn. So from that perspective, that culture of openness, but intentionally being open, being able to stand up in front of the room and say, guys, I screwed up. Here's how, here's why, here's how we make sure not to do the same thing over and over again. And so it's not like we like making mistakes. Anyone who says, oh, failure is great. No, failure is not great. No one likes to fail. No one likes to make mistakes. But if you're going to, and you're going to, you might as well learn and teach from it. So that's one aspect of it. The second is, I love our approach to innovation, which is, if you really want innovation, don't think outside the box. The whole thinking outside the box is wrong. And the reason is, if you think outside the box, that means there's somewhere a box that limits your thinking. If I want to think outside the current uh, way of doing uh, anti-counterfeit, oh, well, everyone uses stickers and tags. How do I make a better sticker? Oh, look, I made a 12-color hologram. You're thinking outside the box, but there's still a box. The approach we take is there is no box. There's no limitations. What would we do if there were no limitations? And when you start there and then work backwards, the ability to innovate is really boundless. That's that's fantastic. And it, it brings me back to, again, another movie reference. This time it's going to be, um, I can't remember the name of it. The one with... Um, Tom Cruise. The, not Tom Cruise. No, uh, <laughs> Hidden Figures. Hidden Figures of the 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 black yeah. women team and NASA yeah. and the whole awesome thing. And it was talking about old math, right? And I think that was the key that she found at the end, or which I don't understand, but to make us get to the moon, right? And I think that's sort of where we're at today. There's there's this box, but there's not a box. And then it's how do we join boxes? And yep. It's super fantastic. Roy, this has been an incredible show today. I'm very excited for what you and Olympian have built and what you will continue to build, the application that this means um, now and, of course, in the future. I'm always trying to work toward a better, safer world. Um, and I think that you guys are doing that one photo at a time. This is fantastic. Thank, Thank you very you. much. It's been a pleasure. Yes, yeah, stick with us just a minute as we go off air. But before we do, well, we're not sure. We do think we have a show coming up tomorrow. We, we're hoping for it, um, but we'll have to confirm that the, the guest, it seems, um, may or may not be able to join us. Um, but if we do, we're going to be talking all about a different type of future, and that is agriculture and how to make water go further. Um, so that's with Aqua Yield tomorrow. Hopefully, catch us at 10 o'clock Pacific. And if you can't, you can catch us on Monday for our recap show also at 10. Thank you, Roy, once again, America, as always. And everyone, have a great rest of your day.